standard acceleration chart of the PTSD estimates. It looks like across all services. The interesting thing about that is that you can identify a suicide. Either it happened or it didn't happen. You can identify an attempted suicide. Either it happened, it, somebody attempted or they didn't. With, um, oh, thanks, Ryan. With uh, TBI, you can identify that because either the person has it as a medical diagnosis or they don't. The problem with PTSD, thanks for putting this one up, is, and you can see it rise during the, uh, during the Iraq Afghanistan uh, intense mm -hmm. uh, deployments, and then you can see it drop. Well, the problem is that um, <clears throat> you look at what the estimate is versus what the reality of people walking in and saying, I think I may have PTSD or I'm having mental health issues or something like that. The reality is that we probably have uh, a whole lot more. We probably have between 200 and 300,000 per year um, PTSD people who could receive help, who could receive treatment, uh, whereas those who actually ask are the dots that are on the chart. So one of Abigail raises a great point here. One of the diagnostic criteria for PTSD is avoidance, right? And so <laughs> it's like, it's like you know it, the problem feeds itself, right? So uh, on one hand, okay, here I am, I have PTSD, which is the hall, one of the hallmarks is avoidance. So now, of course, I'm going to avoid talking about my PTSD, facing my PTSD, getting treatment for my PTSD. And, and this sort of hits on another topic that, that through the military veteran SIG, uh, special interest group uh, in ABAI, that Abigail and I have really tried to um, sort of drill down on. And, and the fact is there are thousands of BCBAs, a, uh, you know, BCABAs, just even RBTs, just folks in our community that could be helping with PTSD but there are no formal vehicles for these folks to uh, approach the military or veteran population because of uh, federal law does not recognize ABA as a uh, meeting the evidence-based standards. Uh, and there's no sort of job description within the federal, the, sort of like a codified system. They have accountants, they have admin, they have physicians, they have social workers, there's no slot for ABA. And so these are barriers at the federal level that that we're in the process of reaching out to uh, the head of ABAI to help us try to resolve because if if we can't resolve it from that level, uh, we're going to have uh, hundreds of thousands of veterans and active duty just continuing to miss out on treatment because the reality is there aren't enough psychologists, social workers, and psychiatrists within the VA or the military medical system to handle all the needs. Yeah. Whether they're ABA trained or whether they're even clinical, they can't uh, handle all of the needs. And so if we could get ABAI to uh, do the necessary work to be recognized for more than just autism, then we would have another um, branch, another medium of helping people with PTSD. And if you, in my opinion, if you look at it behaviorally, it takes the onus off of, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. You know, it's like, we can help you change your behavior. We can, my focus for decades has been changing inner behavior. And, uh, and that's not to say that that's the only way of doing it. I mean, so far, one of the things that the military has done, and I keep thinking of Fort Carson, I don't know why, but uh, because they may have been one of the first places and they're an ideal location in Colorado to do um, the outdoor training, the ropes courses, et cetera, that give, give a military person with PTSD, PTSD a different focus so that they can focus on something. The, the sad part is there are two, the two best treatments for combat related PTSD. One of them is a strictly behavioral approach. It's prolonged imaginal exposure. And uh, it's highly effective. Essentially, the person just uh, sort of recounts the story of their trauma, going through all the details, making sure not to sort of block their emotions, allow their emotions to come up. And it is highly effective. It was developed 
on the battlefields in about 12 sessions twice a week for six weeks uh, originally. Uh, that's that, that was the protocol. They even did it three times a week. And it's it's highly effective. It's well within the skill set, both theoretically and uh, technically, of, of folks who practice ABA. So, in fact, it's much more within their bailiwick than most social workers and counselors. Um, so it's it's a real shame. It's such a missed opportunity to connect the supply of ABA folks with the demand of vets and service members. You know, one of the things, this was not in the military, this was in civilian, but I was principal of a school at Topeka State Hospital, uh, which is no longer in existence, um, where uh, we dealt with children and young adults with very severe mental health issues, uh, PTSD, abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And so we often had restraint situations where we literally had to physically restrain people. Or um, after I left, there were employees who had ended up with broken arms or cracked teeth. Or I remember having a bruise that lasted for four months after a restraint, a particular restraint. And, and one of the things I always did was before those people went home at night, I would talk to each person individually about how are you doing? Because I thought I don't want them to go home and yell at their wife or yell at the cat or, you know, kick the dog or something because they have this leftover. And that on a, um, that was just a casual thing that I thought. I just thought, geez, I don't want these people to go home. But it's yeah. the same kind of thing that Kent was talking about with talking about it when they're out in the field, when there's been a bad situation that you get together, you know, two times a week or three times a week. Isn't that what you said? per week, yeah, and to help yeah. people come down from that experience without uh, dragging it like an albatross over their shoulders.